Hey everyone, I'm Lori Hutchison. I'm the Executive Director of the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, and I'm so excited to welcome everyone to the LBCA Advocate Chat Series. Today is the first in um, several advocacy presentations and dialogues. Um, I should note that the dates and topics for the others in our series are um, going to be at the end of this presentation. You'll see them again. You'll also get an invitation. Um, and uh, be, whoops, it's advancing. There we go. Um, and before we get into the specifics of today's presentation and meet our presenter, I wanted to share a couple of um, quick updates about LBCA. First, um, very exciting, last week we filed for uh, incorporation. So we're well on our way of becoming our own uh, nonprofit organization. Right now we're fiscally sponsored. So by the end of the year, we'll be a tax exempt um, standalone uh, nonprofit. And to assist with that, we are recruiting board members. Um, so if any you or someone you know may be interested in a board of directors role with LBCA, you can email me and I'll send more information after, after this. Um, and last but not least, we're also really excited that uh, we're embarking on two grant making um, endeavors uh, jointly with ASCO and AACR. So it'll be our first um, directly funded ILC grants. Uh, with ASCO, we're going to be funding an early investigator clinical translational focused ILC grant uh, for one year. And with AACR, we're going to be funding a basic science ILC focused grant for an um, early investigator for two years. Um, and then hopefully in later years, we'll do even more. Um, so more on that in the coming weeks. Um, and now I would like to just share a couple of um, housekeeping rules about this presentation. Um, the presentation portion of um, today will be recorded. All of you will be muted. Uh, please do not unmute yourself um, because your picture will pop up too when that happens. Um, and we probably don't, you probably don't want to be recorded. Um, there will be a question and answer period after uh, the presentation um, and that will not be recorded. Um, you can start while you're listening to the presentation and then later on write your questions in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, and during the Q&A portion, uh, our presenter will address questions from the chat and we'll have a moderator who will be calling on people who either indicate in the chat, chat that they'd like to ask a question or that they want their question read. Um, and please note, um, just to remind people, today's presentation, we're not getting into piece, people's personal issues or specific medical questions, um, and they can't be addressed and won't be addressed during this event. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Um, and her name is Lee Pate. And Lee, as probably all of you know, led the founding and growth of the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance. And she was LBCA's lead coordinator until spring of 2020. Lee's background is a public affairs consultant, communication specialist, and writer. She is a trained cancer research advocate and has been involved in advocacy at the local, state, national, and international levels, working with researchers, clinicians, advocates, and patients. Lee is a two-time cancer patient and she lives in Seattle, Washington. And I am now going to turn it over to Lee. Hello, everybody. And um, thank you so much for being here and joining this. And, um, you know, I am very excited about where we are and where, how far we've come with the lobby advocacy. And I think that you all, whether you're just joining us today for the first time to check out advocacy or you've been doing this a while, um, you know, we're, we're here at a really exciting opportunity where I feel like things are really starting to begin to take off and we have, we have many um, paths to success ahead. And I'm, I'm very excited and optimistic about where we can go moving forward to 
advanced meaningful research and really getting lobular breast cancer <clears throat> out there and on the and on the table. Um, so I, a little personally, I was diagnosed in uh, 2011 and um, early stage, uh, stage 2B. And, um, and I began advocacy uh, at about, it took me about three years to get into bec becoming an advocate. And then we really started to get LBCA going and off the ground after the uh, fall of 2016 um, first international symposium. And I, I feel like things have grown and progressed in, in, uh, really quickly as far as cancer, <laughs> cancer world goes from there. Um, so on to the call today, just, just to give you a perspective of who all is joining us. Um, we have uh, international advocates from all over the world, um, Australia, Nigeria, um, India, Canada, Europe, very exciting um, to have such a global effort moving forward. And then we have all kinds of levels of experience on the call today. Uh, about half of you are just starting out and trying to say, gee, what is this advocacy thing? And um, so what we're trying to do in this presentation today is start at the basics and then give tools um, to move forward and decide what it is that you uh, want to do and how you think you might be able to contribute and explore. So our learning objectives today are what is breast cancer advocacy? What is lobular advocacy? Who can be an advocate? Um, what are some different paths or approaches to advocacy? What are some ways that you might want to try to get started? Um, and some resources. Um, so who is an advocate? Well, there, many people use the term advocate in a lot of different ways, um, you know, but basically the crux of what an advocate is, is, is someone who really wants to make a change and just support, <clears throat> to support a, a positive proactive change in the status quo. For, um, for lobular, well, the way we define advocacy for lobular breast cancer is as a patient or a former patient, a caregiver, a family member, or a volunteer who wants to learn more about lobular breast cancer and then use that knowledge to advance research, to educate, or to help others impacted by lobular disease. That's a very broad definition. Now, a lot of organizations, they will define advocacy more narrowly. Some, sometimes people will say, um, an advocate, you know, they, an advocate to them is someone who would merely someone who, who would go to Capitol Hill and lobby for a bill or a policy change. And that's, that's how they call an advocate. And then there's another term that's frequently used in um, more of a social service term. If you're a patient advocate, you could be someone who uh, would uh, probably be a, a social worker who could help connect a patient with financial resources or help be a liaison with their care. And those are not, that's not how we're using that term. And one of the reasons I bring up the fact that many people use the term advocate in different ways is because sometimes you'll be say, talking to someone and saying, oh, well, I'm a patient advocate. And they look at you funny because they are actually thinking you're talking about something else. And sometimes you just have to explain to them what, what you are as an advocate and define it for yourself when you're talking to others moving forward. Um, can we, next slide. So there are many, many attributes to becoming a great advocate and none of us, no matter how hard we polish our halos can ever embody all of these things. Um, and so, but all of us do have skills and abilities and interests and we all have kind of our own little superpower and our way that we can contribute um, and make a difference. So what I wanted to do is to just review some of the things that I think are most important to keep in mind uh, as you're approaching uh, the idea of being an advocate or a research advocate. And the first of all is there's a place for everybody and everyone's skills, everyone's different time levels. Um, and I encourage you to kind of explore a lot of the different opportunities and find what's right for you and the different, the different type of engagement that is the best fit for you. Um, the, the other thing is there's a perception out there that you need to be a scientist or a researcher in order to be a, a good cancer advocate, and that is not the case. Um, 
I myself, I studied, I, I think my last class was biology in ninth grade. Um, and I can tell you, we didn't learn a whole heck of a lot in there. And I've gone back after the fact and have um, acquired a lot of training. I've been, since I've been working with so many researchers, I've gone and taken advantage of some of the training resources to actually learn some of the basics of the science so that I can have um, a little more comprehension and better conversation uh, with scientists. So those resources are out there, but you do not have to be a scientist or a healthcare researcher to contribute and to become an advocate in one of the many different ways. Um, it, it is helpful to be willing to learn and to be willing to listen and to take part in a lot of the learning opportunities that are out there so that you can increase your skills and, and, um, and, and kind of keep on top of, of some of the, the science and the work that's happening more broadly. Um, your voice as a cancer patient and particularly as a lobular breast cancer patient is unique and it's important and it's important to hear. And sometimes we forget that, you know, sometimes we get intimidated and we're afraid to speak up or we're afraid what we say might be wrong or that won't have value. And we always do our best, of course, when we communicate to be accurate and just, and it's okay to say that we don't know, but mostly the point I wanna leave you with is have no fear. <laughs> you have a right to be at the table and you have a right to speak up and your voice and your opinion and your thoughts matter and they offer value to this process. So don't be afraid to do it. Um, you, you have every right to be there and to be involved as an advocate and to work on behalf of other patients for your own care. Another little hint that, um, can we go back up to the other slide? Another little hint is um, the uh, is to um, sometimes I think it's better to give yourself a little bit of time after your diagnosis or certainly if you're in treatment on the other side of of treatment to heal. Um, you know, as we all know, cancer treatment and, and getting a cancer diagnosis is one of these life upending things. And sometimes it can take a little time for things to settle down. So if you are within a year of treatment, my suggestion would be to just take it nice and slow and be very mindful about how you wanna spend your time and what you wanna get involved in as you um, begin to learn about becoming an advocate. Um, the other thing that is important, I believe, when you're talking about advocacy is that remember that you are there as an advocate. Your job is to represent all patients, um, not just your own story. Uh, so, so as an advocate, when you're working with researchers or in a meeting, um, you know, what we're not doing is getting up and we're not telling our own story as far as and asking for personal medical advice and that sort of thing. What we're doing is we're, we're working on behalf of all patients and we're even working on behalf of probably the next generation of patients and people who will come after us so that they will have a better um, experience than we did moving forward. And I think having this perspective is, is quite important. You, would, you will definitely learn things and meet people that will um, help you in your own cancer experience moving forward, but really this work is about focusing forward on the, for the benefit of others and for all patients. Um, and I think those are the main, some of the main overall points for advocacy and, and things to keep in mind. So um, that's the next slide. The, um, so what are some of the goals of lobular advocacy specifically? <clears throat> well, one of the things, as, as you know, with they've just really begun to understand that lobular is a different disease and that some of the therapies that are currently applied to um, patients with lobular, which are the same as ductal, may not necessarily be the best fit for us. And so one of the main goals of lobular advocacy is to advance the research to better understand this disease. Why is it, why is it 
in single file? Why does it spread to the places it spreads? Why, what, what is it that makes this different and what's going on in there? Do the research and the clinical trials to refine therapies that could be better applied to lobular patients. Um, and these have to happen through clinical trials. And then to identify and advance targeted therapies. Targeted therapies mean, and this is precision medicine, right? We, we don't want to be left behind in the precision medicine world. So <laughs> what is it that's peculiar, particularly interesting about, um, about, lob about lobular disease that we can um, work to advance into clinical trials and potentially a druggable um, you know, a, a new drug or therapy for lobular breast cancer. And then, so if that's the main goal, then how do we get there? And, there, and, and this is one of the, um, there's different tools that we need in order to, to make this research happen. One is that we've got to educate and raise awareness about the disease because if people don't know about it <laughs> and they don't know what lobular is and they don't know that it's different and they don't know that the patient experience um, you know, is more difficult kind of being the square peg put in the round hole uh, for treatment, then there's not going to be any change. It's a part of our job as advocates is to make the case and to educate others that it's different and that it matters and that we need the research to refine the therapies. The other thing that to get there is you're going to have, we have to raise the money um, to support the research and we have, or have, we have to advocate to have existing research and funding allocated to lobular breast cancer. Um, and because none of this research is going to happen without dedicated funding uh, or uh, to, to actually drive the research for the disease. And then also to support advocacy directly. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today even and have progressed in the last five years without people people and advocates and patients out vocally working and, and that supporting the advocacy organizations does support the research and help move this forward. Um, we also need to integrate into existing breast cancer resources um, and uh, the um, uh, can you go back to the other slide? <laughs> We also need to integrate into existing breast cancer uh, resources. Um, and so the organizations is, that are focusing on lobular breast cancer, uh, they're focusing on breast cancer are also talking about and integrating lobular and then research advocacy, um, which is basically uh, working directly with researchers um, to, uh, as patients to make sure that their research reflects um, it reflects the priorities of lobular breast cancer. The next slide. So there's a lot of paths to effective advocacy um, and I've listed them, I've got them out here um, and we've talked about fundraising, research advocacy, education, visibility and outreach as being among the most important to support advancing research. I'm gonna go through all of these individually and what they are. Um, but also know that these aren't mutually exclusive uh, things. You can actually hold an event or something and you can um, integrate, you can do outreach, education and fundraising all at the same time. So these are not mutually exclusive activities. Um, so next slide. So educate and raise visibility. So basically the, the general message of this is that not all breast cancer is the same. Um, that lobular breast cancer is different. And our goal as advocates is just to get the word out about that as much and as however, and as to whoever we can and, and whatever ways that we can do it. Um, and the goal of this is to, first of all, articulate and amplify the patient needs for research um, and refine the therapies. Say, hey, we as patients, we need, we need something better here. We need something that's more specific to us. Um, and the second goal is to basic, is go back to the basics and say, hey, what is lobular breast cancer and how is it different? Um, there's different audiences and different messages sometimes will be appropriate to different audiences. So researchers, clinicians, and organizations, often what you're trying to most emphasize with them is saying, hey, patients need this research, you know, 
there's a patient need to spend a lot more research uh, resources and time on lobular. But if you're talking to advocates, patients or the public, a lot of times you're explaining what lobular is and why it's different and why it needs more attention. So um, conduits for uh, education and raise awareness are uh, social media. Uh, many of us are already out there on social media. Um, also in meetings and conferences and events, um, it can be done through the media. There's always, of course, a ton of stories around breast cancer Awareness Month, for example, and even just one-on-one -on -one in different conversations. Um, and we as advocates and patients, one of the most effective ways we can communicate is to share our story personally. That's the thing that we are an expert on is what it was like to be a patient and going through, um, you know, making decisions about treatment when treatment is essentially um, primarily been uh, explored for ductal cancers, not lobular cancers. Um, uh, we can always share information. Um, if we're in a meeting, ask questions. How does this apply to lobular breast cancer? How, you know, um, and raise the issue and make and, and force the conversation of the differences of how lobular is different than ductal. Um, and even just in your basic conversations, you know, sometimes we just say, oh, I had breast cancer. But if you actually say, I have lobular breast cancer, that, that opens a door to a lot of very basic um, communications about what it is, how it's different, and it's a one-on-one it's a -on -one, uh, education opportunity. So next slide. So the other um, part of this is outreach and inclusion. And the general idea of this is like, there is a lot of organizations there's a lot of attention and resources already on breast cancer uh, within your cancer institutions, within um, you know, all of the, the major organizations or local organizations that exist, um, surely because there's so much breast cancer in the world. I think now it's the number one cancer, diagnosed cancer. Um, but the idea here is to integrate lobular within existing resources um, so that, that we, uh, are part of um, the conversation uh, and ha and get a, a piece basically of all of the, of the time and the resources that are spent. So a lot of this happens um, and it's, it comes, it starts with networking locally with your local cancer institution or breast cancer organizations or patient advocacy groups. Um, it starts with building relationships with the people who are running those groups or involved. It can be volunteering locally with those groups. Um, and volunteering could be if there's an event going on and you say, gee, wouldn't it be great to have some literature about lobular breast cancer? Um, then you often will need to do the follow-up to provide that or to staff the table or to organize the meeting you know, or the breakout session because um, a lot of these organizations are very well-meaning, um, but they're also limited really in a lot of their research and time and expertise. And you may in fact be the most expert person there on lobular breast cancer, and they may well look to you to take the lead to actually create that part of the programming or that opportunity. And so um, part of integrating integrating um, lobular into existing resources is also being willing to be the person or to help make that happen. Um, and that's just the reality of, of where we are uh, in, um, uh, you know, in this, in this advocacy and effort. Um, the other thing is to be thinking about how to represent and have lobular represented in programs, committees, funding and educational resources. Uh, it could be saying, hey, can you, um, this website doesn't mention lobular breast cancer. Can we add some resources and links onto here to include it? Um, it could be your cancer institution uh, has a patient research group and you say, can we integrate, make sure there's a lobular breast cancer representative as part of this patient advocacy group at the institution. Um, if they're doing a CME or a continuing education class, say, is it possible to do a, 
you know, integrate Lobular into the curriculum. Um, these are all things that are, that are possible. Uh, next slide. So research advocacy, I think that's when we talk about advocacy, this is what a lot of people think of. Um, research advocacy is basically where you're trying to, uh, you're linking patients and scientists um, and making sure that the patient perspective is integrated into scientific decisions. Um, the ultimate goal of research advocacy specifically is to make sure that lobular is integrated into appropriate larger studies, bigger ER, estrogen receptor positive studies, things like that, where they actually, actually have subsets and we, there's enough patients enrolled in those subsets. And the objectives of the study include understanding the differences between lobular and ductal. And you can't do that if you don't have enough patients enrolled or if it's not a part of the study uh, and it's part of the goals of the study. Um, it's also about supporting new research and trying to get more new research going. Uh, it's about um, basically representing lobular patient needs and existing research. So for example, we know lobular is uh, harder to see on scans. And so the trials with resist measurable criteria in the metastatic community um, can potentially inadvertently ex exclude patients with metastatic lobular breast cancer. And this is a point that no one's gonna think about unless an advocate raises it <laughs> um, and, and raises that point. <clears throat> so there are a lot of ways to get involved in research advocacy. Um, and different roles for research advocates. Uh, you can partner with researchers to put together a grant application um, to try to shape that application, sign on to it, um, and try to get funding uh, for a specific research project. Uh, you can participate in peer review where you're actually reviewing grant requests and um, part of the decision team on what gets funded and what doesn't and offering comments back. Uh, institutions have uh, institutional review boards that uh, will usually include a patient advocate representative and that's the job of that is to make sure a clinical trial going on at an institution is safe. Um, the, uh, there are also many institutions that have their own patient advocate groups and those are the kind of the go-to groups that researchers within that institution will turn to to um, partner with their researchers on specific research projects. So if your institution has a group like that, uh, getting involved in that is a good way to get involved in, in research advocacy locally. Um, there are also many conferences and events that uh, go on that you can participate in as a research advocate, um, such as San Antonio or ASCO or some of these big conferences. And much of, many of those now are more open and available than they used to be because they're online through Zoom. And then there's even ways to conduct and present research. At LBCA, we've done two posters at, at um, the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium uh, where we presented research and findings. Uh, and I know Lobular Breast Cancer UK is working on a couple of, of their of research projects as well. So you can even conduct and pre present your own research um, if that's what you have interest in. Um, so how you get involved with this by, um, you, mostly the best way to get involved is really to start local, um, tend to meet local advocates and researchers. You can try to contact uh, researchers directly. Um, and uh, if you, you know, one of the good suggestions that's gonna be in a resource list that's gonna go out is to, um, if you have, if there's a researcher that you find their work interesting, you can actually email them and say, gee, I find your work really interesting. I would love to get a tour of your lab or can I learn more? And most of them are actually very receptive to, um, requests like that. And then you could have an opportunity to meet this person and start forming the relationship that could lead to future work together as a research advocate. Um, there are many 
uh, research advocacy, not many, there are research advocacy programs and uh, a lot of this information is going to be on a resource list and you can join and participate in one in some of the programs that they have. Uh, and there's also advocacy training available and this is where you can get into the nuts and the bolts of the science or how to review a grant. Um, and then LBCA has a research advocacy toolkit online that's gonna that has a lot of different uh, resources and I believe that's going to be updated and re-released soon um, but there is some there's information online now um, next slide <clears throat> okay so the other ways to get involved in advocacy fundraising um, we all know what fundraising is uh, and um, what the meaningful ways to get involved in fundraising uh, would be to support LBCA is one way through different fundraising initiatives. Um, and that, so that promotes advocacy and also helps, uh, as of this year, will help fund ILC research. Um, and then there's institution-based um, research funds. So there's at several institutions around the US now, there's um, some different lobular focused research funds that have been started up, many by advocates, where they are working to fund lobular research at the specific institutions. And this gets a little complicated and probably not something just to jump right into, but um, I think this is something we're gonna see more and more of is more institutional-based lobular funds moving forward. Um, and then uh, the other way is to, is to try to influence the organizations and the existing funding resources to do more funding of lobular specifically. Um, so other ways to be an advocate are peer support. Um, you know, a lot of people, they just really want to, they're like, gosh, I got through my cancer journey and I really just want to help other people. Um, and LBCA doesn't do peer support directly, but there are many organizations that do and um, partner organizations that you can volunteer with directly and there's uh, resources available for that. Um, uh, and then um, policy advocacy is another, this is also something that LBCA doesn't do directly right now, but um, the idea of policy advocacy is you can actually, you're actually trying to change policy to, um, to benefit cancer patients. So a big thing is trying to lobby for more funding, more government funding for cancer research, for example, um, to uh, try to protect uh, from cuts in funding to cancer research. Uh, that's another one. Um, sometimes you can get involved state by state and there's been a lot of local efforts to expand insurance coverage. For example, for, example, for diagnostic uh, mammograms would be an example. Um, so there's, there, that's a whole effort in itself, and there's different organizations that lead that. Um, National Breast Cancer Coalition and Komen um, Policy Advocacy Department do national lobbying. Cancer Society, Mediviver um, has a, a stage four stampede that they do every year in Congress, and they do some other work for metastatic uh, and lobbying for metastatic work. Breast density has had a very successful camp state-by-state uh, -state effort to change policies about breast density notifications. Um, and then there's also a lot of, of breast cancer coalitions in every state. So if that's your interest, there's a whole lot of ways to get involved in policy advocacy. Next slide. So what are some, how are some ways to get started? And this is where I wish I could offer here is your five-step plan for becoming an advocate. But unfortunately, you know, we as people aren't that simple and the advocacy world's not that simple. So this is really kind of a way for you to um, dig in, see what the right fit is, try things out, um, and, uh, you know, find, find the way that's going to be right for you. And so what we're trying to do is offer a lot of resources to be helpful with that. Um, so step one, one is dig in the research advocacy toolkit and the resource list um, and, and see what's out there and available that might be of interest to you and how you wanna uh, participate. Um, you know, 
plug in. There's a lot of advocacy and things that are happening locally. Starting locally is really how most advocates get started. It's what's happening in their local communities, their breast cancer organization or uh, research institution. And if you're interested in advocacy, ask your care team. They're going to know about things going on uh, or even the patient services department at your, your health institution. Try to go meet other advocates, um, you know, involved with your breast cancer organization. Uh, you know, look um, into your institution and see what, what opportunities there are there. Do they have a patient advisory committee? Is there a conference that you can sign up for and register for as an advocate or go volunteer for? What events do they have going? But really, you're just trying to get to know people and to find your place and and within an institution, and that opens up a lot of other opportunities moving forward. Networking, you know, think of it like a job. You're trying to get in there and network and meet people who can open up doors for you and give you opportunities, and you can learn from um, as you get still going. Sometimes with lobular breast cancer. We, we want to wait around and be invited to participate in something, um, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we have to make our own seat at the table, very politely, of course, but we have to create our own opportunities. And this is important um, and because pretty much all of the major initiatives that have happened for lobular breast cancer so far have happened because people have created those opportunities. Um, now, the cancer world can be very receptive to this, um, and they usually are. They're very welcoming and receptive, but, you know, suggesting and creating your own place is, is often necessary. And so this goes back to the no fear thing. Don't be afraid to propose and suggest this, and you don't have to wait to be invited. Um, <clears throat> Learning, uh, just look, look at the training opportunities and the advocate networks and a lot of the resources that are already out there. And again, these are gonna be on this resource list. We've got a lot of them. Um, volunteering, again, this is um, how you get experience and how you get to know people and what you're interested in and how they get to know you and how to, and can bring you and tap you and and open up and introduce you to other opportunities that you might be interested in. And then um, I know many people would rather have their molars extracted than be on social media, but if you are a social media person, um, get in there and, and make a presence for yourself. Um, I will say Facebook is the place where a lot of patients congregate and talk to each other and that's um, but if you want to talk and be looped in more with researchers, then you really want to be on Twitter. Uh, that's where researchers and clinicians are. And if you're on Twitter, here's the hashtags that you will want to be, at least just starter hashtags to be connected with. Um, the next slide. Here's some advocacy resources. Um, the research advocacy and training and policy advocacy, they're not the same thing, but the, both of these organizations offer both of these, um, uh, both policy advocacy and research training. So there's sort of one-stop shopping for, <laughs> for um, both. And then peer support, um, if you're interested in being a peer support mentor, both of these organizations uh, are offering you know, good training uh, within their volunteer capacity to be a, a peer support and they will match lobular volunteers with lobular patients who are looking for support. 